So our scripture reading, our scripture reading this morning, am I on? Okay. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, um, which we often call Philippians. And uh, it is a piece of his letter that is ancient, ancient, ancient. It's probably the earliest piece of written liturgy we have. And it's probably only 15 to 25 years after uh, Jesus. I mean, it's really close to the, the, the life of Jesus as a written document. It's a, it's a hymn. It's actually probably a confession of faith, what we might even call a creed. And here's what it says. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, and he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. May the Spirit bless the reading of this ancient hymn even today. Amen. So, have you ever been to a retirement party? Uh, I was recently at a retirement party. And uh, if you've ever been to the kind of retirement parties I've been to, people get up and they tell stories about this person who's retiring. In my case, colleagues got up and started telling all these stories about the funny and somewhat annoying things that this friend of mine, this woman did, at staff meetings. Friends, including me, got up and started telling stories about all the trips they took with her and all the interesting idiosyncrasies that she was known for. Family members, too, they got up and started telling all of these stories that were a bit embarrassing <laughs> about what she was like around the dinner table or right after she got up in the morning or having curlers in her hair. You know, the stories go on and on. And with each story usually came some correction, like someone from the audience that would say, wait, 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 no, that's not exactly how it happened. Or, oh, I was there, you missed this part of the story, you better include that. Or, oh, wait, that reminds me of yet another story. Which all, I think, all of these stories tried to do was to paint a picture to paint a picture of who this person is, who she continues to be, and the significance of her presence in our lives and the impact that she has made on the world. This sounds oddly similar to reading Christian scriptures, stories that paint a picture, stories that try to make sense of who Jesus was, who Jesus was to them and who Jesus continues to be for us, the significance of his presence in their lives and the impact that he has had on our lives. Today, we embark on a new sermon series in preparation for our guest lecturer who's coming, Marcus Borg, who will join us for our McKinsey Lecture, January 25th through 27th. 
Many of you know of Borg's work, but if you don't, he's a well-known New Testament scholar and a prolific author. He's also an active contributor to the Jesus Seminar, this well-known collaborative that's endeavoring to research the historical Jesus. In Borg's most recent book, Speaking Christian, he is trying to take a fresh look at some of these very common and often misappropriated words in Christian discourse. Some of these phrases will sound familiar to you. Salvation, sin, repentance, heaven, hell, forgiveness. These, all these words have a lot of baggage, I might say. But Borg is interested in reclaiming these words out of their everyday vernacular use in our media and in our sort of contemporary discourse because they've been altered significantly from their original historical intent. So over the next few weeks, Marty and I are going to be engaging some of these themes and Borg's contribution to the discussion. And today, today, of course, you wouldn't be surprised to know we're taking a look at Jesus. Who was Jesus? Who is Jesus. Which Jesus is right? Which one is most accurate? And does it does it matter? Now, this is a, a God thing because Deborah and I didn't talk about what she was going to do with the children. And yet, I'm now moving right into the metaphor of how artists depict Jesus in their art. So the Spirit's really moving here. And I think she did it beautifully with the kids. Artists have been depicting Jesus in countless ways throughout the centuries. And I think it's fair to say that Christians have been doing the same thing as well, right down to today. And this shouldn't surprise us, of course, because any honest reading of the Gospels and the Scripture in New Testament, not to mention the non-biblical books, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, some of those other non-canonical Gospels, all of these attempt to present us varying views of Jesus. Bruce Metzger, who served as professor of Bible at Princeton Seminary for many, many years, has this phrase, and he says, the Gospels present us with various portraits of Jesus not pictures, portraits, just as Deborah mentioned. In painting a portrait, the subject inspires the artist to capture the essence of the subject using the artist's own particular style and approach. So imagine for a moment, um, we had three artists. We had Picasso and Monet and maybe someone contemporary, Barbara Remington, say, all looking at that beautiful flower, that orchid. And they all were to paint a picture. And I dare say that all the paintings would look somewhat similar and very different. Not unlike the four very different portraits of Christ on the front of the bulletin. And this is not unlike the very diverse portraits we have of Jesus in Scripture. For example, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew portrays Jesus as Emmanuel. In fact, uses the word in his birth narratives, which we just celebrated at Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. John, a more Gnostic-leaning Gospel, portrays Jesus as the Logos, this Greek philosophical term for divine wisdom, what we call the word. Well, not word on a page, but the wisdom of the word that comes incarnate in human experience. The Gospel of Mark is interested in the phrase son of God, although not exclusively because others use that phrase as well. And all four Gospels refer to Jesus as the son of man. Well, in Greek, 
huios tuo anthropuo, anthropuo, the son of humanity, anthropuo, where we get the word anthropology. And this word seems to be the, fra- the phrase that Jesus prefers the most. Well, what's the point of all this? Well, I think it's to say that in many ways we still do the same thing as well. We construct different portraits of who Jesus is to engage in our own theological enterprise. Now, for some of us, Jesus is this Jewish revolutionary Messiah who came to offer an alternative vision to Roman occupation. He's a revolutionary. For others of us, Jesus was this wise sage who fully embodied the divine incarnation, fully human, fully divine. For others, Jesus was this... (coughs) radical countercultural leader of this vagabond group of ragtag, marginalized working peasants who were trying to experience wholeness in their lives. For others of us, Jesus is the suffering servant who was crucified on the cross. I could go on and on because I would venture to guess there are just as many Jesuses in this room as there are us. And yet, and yet we still ponder this question, who is Jesus? We still try to make sense of it. We still try to articulate a meaning of what this person who lived 2,000 years ago still has for our lives today. And indeed, I think the followers of Jesus, Christians have been doing this throughout the centuries. Marcus Borg, he puts it this way. Jesus is, for us as Christians, the decisive revelation of what a life full in God looks like. Let me say that again. Jesus is the decisive revelation of what a life full of God looks like. A life radically centered on God, filled with the Spirit. Jesus was this epiphany. We are in the season of epiphany. This epiphany of the divine word embodied in human life. Jesus is this decisive revelation of who God is and who we are in relationship to God. So, Jesus lived from Galilee. He lived and he taught and he healed and he prayed and then died by crucifixion. And then there was this moment, the Easter moment, the resurrection. Perplexing. We're going to engage that a little more in a few weeks. But for the moment, this moment in time, the, the, cruci- the resurrection becomes this transition point for Jesus, the pre-Easter Jesus, and Christ, the post-Easter Christ. Well, what does that mean? So after Jesus' death and resurrection, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter to the Philippians, he has this experience of the risen Christ on the road to Emmaus. And this experience is so powerful Experiencing this post-Easter Jesus, this experience was so powerful that his life was forever changed. His life was forever changed. It seems to me that we too, when we experience this post-Easter Jesus, this Christ presence, when we experience this, our lives are changed forever. The difficulty, of course, comes in trying to figure out what's the human side of this Jesus and which is the Christ side of this Jesus. And that takes us to this ancient, ancient hymn. This piece in Philippians engages, I think, the same struggle that many of us wrestle with. 
Who is this Jesus guy? And what's this relationship between Jesus and God? And what does it all mean for me? So Paul uses this beautiful phrase. I love this phrase. Born in human likeness. Found in human form. It's in many ways one of the most compelling parts of the Jesus narrative for me. And that is that God came in human form to experience life like me. God can relate. Jesus experienced it all. All the suffering of life, all the challenges, all the hurts and the loss, all the joys and the excitement, all of it. This is what we say in the United Church of Christ statement of faith. God shares our common lot through Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus has a clue about what it's like to live the life that we live. Now, then notice, where does Paul go next, right? So God came in human form. It's a radical proposition. And now he says, Christ humbled himself, taking the form of a servant, being obedient, even to the point of death. For Paul, the divine side of Christ shines in and through Jesus' humanity. How? Through examples of servanthood. How he modeled justice-seeking and peace and radical hospitality and unconditional love. And Paul suggests that we too, we too can experience this amazing transformation when we open ourselves to Christ and when we follow the path of Jesus. This, I think, is a great contribution that Marcus Borg offers to our discussion. And that is this idea of the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus. The pre-Easter Jesus, the one who was born a Galilean Jew, a flesh and blood human being just like us, who had a beginning and an end, but more powerfully, at least for us, followers of Jesus, that this post-Easter Jesus continued to be a presence in the followers' lives in a powerful way. The followers of Jesus experienced him as being a spiritual reality in their lives and continues to right here today. For Christ is risen right here in this body in this body of Christ gathered here this morning. So, does this mean we have it all figured out? Not, not quite. Indeed, it is a mystery. This question between the Jesus, the man of Galilee, and Jesus the Christ, the divine. And indeed, I think such mysteries will never be fully settled. In fact, I hope they never are. Because in some sense, I think the mystery keeps us engaged in this question. Who is this Jesus? And who is this Jesus for me? So, we've talked about the multiple portraits of Jesus. We've talked about the, the creed that was this ancient creed that wrestled with the same question of the human and the divine. And we have Borg's pre-Easter and post-Easter Jesus. Let's wrestle with just one last one, and that is this phrase that we read in Philippians, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. This phrase is perhaps the most common ancient creed in the early church. Jesus is Lord. Well, what on earth does that mean? So in Greek, Jesus is Lord is kurios lesios. Kurios is the Lord part. It's where we get in Latin kyrie, and which we heard the choir sing beautifully recently. Kyrie, Lord. Kurios in Greek is Lord. The problem is that it's used in many different contexts in antiquity, right? So it refers to someone of higher social status. Kurios, Lord. Are, are you watching Downton Abbey? 
right? Lord grant them, right? Okay, that in that in that way it's used was used in antiquity as well. It's used to refer to kings all over Mesopotamia. It's referred, and this is interesting, in the Hebrew Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the word for God, the one that traditionally we don't say out loud, Yudve Hadve, is what we say um, Yahweh, right? The name for God. When we take that Hebrew, it was translated into Greek kurios, and so it's translated into our Bible as Lord. But if you ever look at your Bible, it's in all caps. In the Old Testament, if Lord shows up at caps, it means the Hebrew God Lord, not another Lord. And finally, and this is the tricky one, Curios is used for the Roman emperor, Caesar. And this is Borg's point. When we say, when the followers of Jesus said, Jesus is Lord, they're challenging this very precarious position. Caesar Augustus, Caesar was Lord, was the term son of God was used for Caesar, savior of the world. All these words were used for Caesar. And in the empire, the Roman Empire, you were required to worship Caesar. But the followers of Jesus, nope, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my emperor, the ultimate authority in my life. Unfortunately, it's why we had so many hundreds of years of Christian martyrs, because refusing to worship the emperor meant you were often fed to the lions in the Colosseum. Of course, I think, the same question could be asked of us today. Who is our Lord? To whom or to what do we owe our loyalty and our allegiance? What is sovereign in our life? What is ruling our life every single day? Is it a person? Is it a relationship? Is it a substance? Is it a behavior? What is it that is sovereign in your life? When we proclaim that Jesus is Lord, we're proclaiming that our relationship with God, our experience of the divine presence in our lives is primary in our life, above all else. And I, and I for, for one, I live my life differently because of it. Perhaps, Perhaps you don't think Jesus really was divine. Maybe you think he was a wise sage, a spiritual teacher. Okay, great. Now follow what he taught, and I promise you, your life will be radically different because of it. Or perhaps you really don't worry about who this Jesus guy was. Anyways, you're really more attuned to the the, the spirit in your life, the Christic presence that's leading you and guiding you. Great. Now follow the Spirit's calling on your life, and I promise you, your life will be radically different because of it. Or perhaps, perhaps you really don't believe any of this at all. And you don't really have any relationship with God or with a higher power or anything greater than yourself. Okay, great. Now, try living your life as if there was. As if it all didn't depend on you. And that a power greater than yourself was involved in the daily activities of your life. And I promise you, your life will be radically different because of it. My friends, I think that's what it means to say Jesus is Lord. To say that I have the mind that was in Christ Jesus. That to follow this Lord, to make this one, this way, 
emperor in my life means that my life will be radically changed because of it. And that, my friends, is a beautiful thing. Amen.